like to go and and that that plan changes four or five times kind of like undergrad changing your major it's sort of we all know the the major but where do i go with it and um, and that's the beauty of pt right is we have so many different areas that we can use our our skill set so my my goal for today is to sort of give a overarching preview of all the things that pediatric pt might encompass um and of course answer questions that people have um all the way from, you know, what do I do with my clinicals? What are your recommendations looking for a job? All the way through, you know, getting a clinical specialist designation, if that's something anyone is interested in. So I'll do another little brief intro for myself, and then um, we can kind of get into everything. But feel free to throw questions in the chat or just unmute yourself. I, I said earlier, I don't want this to feel like another lecture that you have to sit through on Zoom for the day. So um, I'm, I'm all for people chiming in, you know, wherever necessary. So slow me down if I'm going too fast. <clears throat> but this is me. <laughs> um, I am Cameron Brown, as Diana said. Um, I graduated from the University of St. Augustine in San Marcos in 2012. So another California, you know, PT student <laughs> representing here. Um, I did, after graduating, I worked for nine years in a few different outpatient clinics um, in LA County. Oh, yay, Taylor, another Aggie. I, I played on the women's rugby team while I was at Davis. So that was, that's my big Aggie rugby, Aggie pride piece. <laughs> um, but yes, very, very California all the way through. Um, and so I, I worked in a, a few different clinics, all outpatient, but very multidisciplinary in a lot of different sort of scope within that. I worked with kids in early intervention. I worked through school districts and also um, with medical insurance, Kaiser programs we contracted with, Anthem Blue Cross, things like that. Um, I did last year, finally got my pediatric clinical specialist designation. So just basically had my round two of board exam, but all for pediatric content, um, really because my goal was to come to teaching in the long run. So that's where I am now at West Coast University. Um, I've been there since fall of 2020, but just this last summer is when I came on full time. So I have been, oh good, Chris is here. Hi, Chris. Um, so I've been teaching at West Coast in the neuromuscular coursework, um, some clinical skills, and of course I teach the pediatric content. So um, a lucky 11 students will be with me this summer for our pediatrics elective, um, where we get to just kind of do all the fun stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, I was trying to think if there was anything other than that. I, I have a four-year-old ball of energy at, at home here locked out behind me. Um, so I have my own pediatric sort of case study to, to live with and film. And my students who are here who have been through my class have already seen videos of him <laughs> from rolling and pulling to stand and doing all those things. And otherwise, yes, I'm involved with National Association for Black Physical Therapists. Um, I'm a mentor in that program, as well as the APTA section on pediatrics, which I'll kind of share a little bit more about later because um, they're a great resource for anybody interested sort of in this area. But I thought it would help to even sort of discuss my experience finding pediatrics. Um, I talk a lot about how, you know, when I was in PT school and even getting to PT school, really, if I had my way, if the world was a perfect place, a summer camp counselor would be a full-time career and that would be my job and that was my happy place. But I thought, okay, well, I can't do that year round. That won't pay the bills. So I guess I'll go to grad school and you know, just <laughs> accept that. Um, so I'd always worked with kids in different contexts, you know, from babysitting and sports and after school programs, things like that. But I never considered pediatric PT, didn't really know it was a thing at all. Um, going into PT school, um, I think similar to most other folks, I mostly was in an outpatient ortho clinic. I was, really loved it. I did my bare minimum inpatient hours <laughs> and, and called it a day. Um, so when I discovered that pediatric PT existed, I was like, well, this is interesting. We'll see. And the biggest hang up I had coming into it without really knowing anything was, yeah, I've worked with kids before. I, you know, I'm comfortable working with kids, but most of these kids have disabilities. And like, whoa, that's scary. And I don't know if I can handle that. And that's like a whole nother world. And when I finally got to my first pediatric rotation, I was like, they're kids. <laughs> it was just so apparent that it really isn't that different. Sure, I might have to adjust my communication style. Sure, you know, you adapt to different things, but ultimately they're kids and they want to have fun and sing songs and play games just like everybody else. So once I realized it wasn't this terrifying mountain of, oh my gosh, there's all these wild things you have to deal with. Then I was like, 
wow, this is awesome. This combines all these fun things. So for me, I, I'd always had an interest in the neuro side of life too. And peds uh, overlaps quite a bit with neuro. Um, and so once I was there and had my foot in a clinic and I, you know, had a chance to be on a scooter board, it, it was done. And that was my, my fate was settled and nothing else could change it. And so here I am, that, that's where I've been. So I do encourage everyone to keep an open mind and sort of, you know, don't turn down an opportunity if you have a chance to maybe see what this is about. But I recognize it's not for everybody. <laughs> um, I do like this video. This is from um, the pediatric physical therapy section of the Choose PT. I put the link at the bottom, but I, I think it's a good tiny little intro video. Um, obviously, you've asked me to explain what it is, but I'm letting <laughs> Tina Duong do it for me. I just think it's a really helpful video. And primarily because it gives you a visual a little bit of some of like the types of spaces we might work in and the types of kids that we um, might work with. It's very short, so um, bear with me, but I think this will be a nice little intro. I'm Tina Duong and I work at Children's National Medical Can Center. Can you hear the video? And today we're gonna to talk about pediatric physical therapy. So pediatric physical therapists work on a wide range of diseases as well as ages. It could range from working for, uh, with preterm infants in the NICU and with a lot of positioning and things all the way up to 18, um, 25 year olds and working on how they're gonna transition into school, into college or into the workforce. If your child's to go to physical therapy, there's multiple environments in which that may happen. One could be in the school, the other could be in the home, and the other could be in the, a hospital or an outpatient clinic. I think the most effective therapy has always involved families and caretakers. The more involved families are, the better the outcome actually becomes. So the beauty of pediatric physical therapy is um, I find it um, a very creative way of helping people move. If a therapist is working with a child and they look like they're having a really great time, it's actually really good therapy because what's happening in the therapist's mind is how do I want this child to move? I want their plots to work. How do I get their plots to work? It's not like with adults, you could say, okay, do 15 wall squats. So we're going to strengthen these quad muscles. Instead with kids, you have to be an animal. You have to be whatever it is you have to do. You have to jump. You have to integrate that into what they do, what kids consider fun. In pediatrics, there's a lot of understanding motor movements and how a child grows up. And part of growing up is not only learning motor skills, but as they get older and their body changes, um, how they move may change or what they need may change. And so as they transition from elementary school to middle school to high school, there are things that need to be adjusted. If you're a parent who has a child in physical therapy, what you should really expect is to always be involved in the actual process. So you should always be in the therapy session with them for the most part, because most of the therapy that should happen should happen not even within the treatment, but after once, once you go home. And so all this has to be integrated because the movement has to be learned and it's not learned within an hour session once a week in therapy. It takes, it takes a group effort to make sure it happens. Okay. So I just think she touched on a lot of really, really good key points. Of course, there's a huge scope, right? I think she was giving a little bit more context, maybe to outpatient model when she said something like, okay, it doesn't work. You know, one hour a week isn't going to make or break it, you know, but which is a model for most of the kids um, with long-term, you know, therapy needs. But um, I, I really like that you get to kind of see some of the toys and the games and just the concept of, we have to be very creative. I, I do think some people might see peds as like, oh, well, that's just the kind of like lightweight, fun PT. You know, it's it's a little bit easier, but ultimately it really challenges your clinical reasoning, your creativity, and your really your ability to kind of understand what you're doing and why, because you can't autopilot to, all right, you had this surgery, let's do these exercises. You know, it even with children with the same diagnosis at the same age, you have to approach everybody so differently and it really keeps you on your toes. Um, so we'll kind of talk a little bit more about that and some of the pros and, and cons of this area, but I would like to just kind of cover briefly all the areas that PTs may show up for kids. Um, thinking just in general about the scope of physical therapy as a whole, pretty much any condition, any body system is, is open game as long as it's you know in a little person. So um, of course, we see um, children in outpatient settings that could be multiple different ways, which I'll talk a little bit more about some of these settings, um, but also inpatient acute care, just like adults, post-op care, limb amputations, there's all kinds of, you know, different reasons that a child might need um, acute care rehab. 
Um, there's of course therapy through the school, which is very unique to pediatrics and it's considered part of their education, what, what we can offer. There's also, as she mentioned very briefly in the beginning, um, neonatal intensive care unit has physical therapists in it. Very, very small, teeny tiny babies, right? Um, all the way through, we can still do home health. Often it's with the early intervention kiddos. That's how the model is set up. Um, but you can also be involved with things like youth sports and adaptive rec. So if you're thinking, you know, this is limited only to children at very low levels or with severe physical limitations, really PTs can be present everywhere, right? Um, and so I think it just helps to kind of give a wider scope, um, which is why this is an even shorter video, I promise. But this is a video from CHLA. They're the one California-based um, residency program for um, pediatrics, if, if anyone is interested later in that route of residency. But um, they offer, obviously, a lot. CHLA is a huge medical hub, right, that a lot of children in the area come to. So I just like that it gives a tiny bit of a preview of sort of inpatient and outpatient, and you can kind of see what it looks like in different settings. At Children's Hospital Los Angeles, we treat children with complex physical therapy needs. In providing acute care, we help children regain their mobility and strength. In inpatient rehabilitation, we restore <coughs> patients' function and educate their families so they are better prepared to return home. In outpatient, we provide individualized therapies to improve balance, flexibility, and developmental skills. In each of our different settings, our physical therapy goals are the same, to provide quality care and help every patient get moving again. I think I'm biased because that little baby is so cute in there. But, you know, when you think about peds, that's several very different scenarios in your mind, right? And even when we say children, that could be a 17-year-old child, right? Um, and especially when we're working through the school district, that's actually all the way up through 21 years old. They're supported um, by the school district, children are. So um, it's a very wide range of possibilities, right? If, if we're thinking, oh, but, you know, I kind of like peds, but I also really like inpatient. Well, great, you can do them both, right? Um, so I just thought it was a nice visual, that, that video to kind of see, we may be working with lines and monitors, or we might be out riding a tricycle and, and running. Um, so it's, it's a very wide scope, which may be good or bad, depending on, you know, how you're looking at it. But I do like to emphasize too, Everything that happens to adults can potentially happen to children too, right? Pediatric limb amputations for congenital limb deformities. You might be seeing babies with torticollis, which is just a condition which kind of limits the motion of their neck. And you may be seeing oncology patients too and working on energy levels and fatigue restoration with, with chemo. So um, I, I like to include a few pictures too, just for those who maybe haven't been in a pediatric facility or site you may be using equipment like this. This is one of the um, clinics I used to work at, just one of our a half of one of our gyms, but you may have really cool foam, colorful, everything type of equipment, or you might have a, a Swiss ball and a mirror and, and that's all you need, right? Um, often the equipment looks very similar to things that we would see maybe in another facility, right? This like Dyna disc and Airx pads, steps, things like that, but it might also be a little bit different in terms of slides or, or foam padded things. Um, the roadie horse is like a beloved <laughs> pediatric um, therapeutic equipment piece that, that all the kids really enjoy bouncing on roadie. I have the off-brand target version, which is a hippo, but it still works. Um, so I, I also like to throw this in there too, because even though we do therapeutic things, you saw some TheraBands in there, you know, maybe we use weighted balls we're also just using kids stuff, right? And that's kind of what ultimately motivates our patients and keeps them engaged. It could be things like what they may play with, you know, what any child might play with some bubbles, cause and effect toys, puzzles. I love the little stomp rockets or this like froggio for, for balance activities. Um, but even with little kids, sometimes, you know, we try not to bring in additional toys or do too many bells and whistles. Sometimes it can be as simple as a laundry basket, a, a Amazon box, especially when we moved to telehealth in 2020, I did a whole year of telehealth and you really get creative with what people have around the house, something like a towel, or this is my favorite, like $3 Ikea step stool. All these things can become therapeutic. I, I wanted a picture of the rice bottle with a lid on it, but I couldn't find one, but 
who needs a fancy musical toy when you can shake up a bottle with something interesting in it? Um, and these are just rolled up socks, which I've used a lot to practice with coordination and strength and trunk rotation and throwing and all kinds of fun things. So the, the sky is the limit, but thinking about PT and our role specifically, and yeah, Zainab saying her nieces prefer this. Half the time, yes, the kids would much rather play with your real car keys than the fake keys because they know what's important, right? They figured out like, well, you're not playing with these. You're playing with that nice cell phone. I think I'd rather have that. But <laughs> but yes, therapy does not need to be expensive or fancy, right? It can just be life and whatever's around. Um, so yeah, our role as PTs, I think very similar to in any setting, right? Our primary role is to evaluate and treat our patients. That, that's pretty straightforward. That's what we signed up for. I think one of the bigger shifts for pediatrics is that we really, really, really do focus on participation, um, which I think all PT is ultimately gaining for gaining to do, right? Um, and hopefully if everyone's familiar with the ICF model, um, I know my first year West Coast students have heard me preach about it, but it never goes away. Live it, learn it, love it. Um, but ultimately, yeah, we might be working on your ankle dorsiflexion range of motion, but none of that matters to a kid. They're not going to come say, oh, I'd really like to get the last 10 degrees, you know, of, of elbow extension back. No, they're going to say, I want to do the monkey bars. I want to, you know, play with my friends. Their family is going to say, I want them to be able to do this. They're not coming in saying, well, I'd really like them to have a five out of five MMT in their quads, right? So we really, really, really zoom back and focus on what is this child need? What is their participation? Because that changes, right? With their different ages. Participation for a three-year-old is going to look different than for a 15-year-old. Um, and it's very individualized in that sense. But ultimately, we're here to say, go live your life, go have fun, go be free, go play, get in trouble. I tell parents that all the time. I'm like, my job is to get them in trouble. My job is to get them crawling so they can pull over that trash can and see what is inside. And when parents tell me now they're climbing out of their crib, I'm like, we've done it. Got, you know, this is our job, right? Because kids are supposed to get in trouble and that's how we learn, right? And develop just as humans. Um, but of course we have a really, really big component. Um, I think more so than working with adults in educating everyone. I think those in acute care have a little bit more of a responsibility in educating families and caregivers, especially for discharge. But for pediatrics, unfortunately, <clears throat> if you're someone like me who initially got in saying, well, I don't like grownups and people are not fun and I'd rather be with kids and they're just easier. For every child, there's at least one and generally more adults that you then have to interact with. So I didn't get to avoid interacting with adults as I thought I would, but it really did allow me to gain more skills in educating families and what we do and explaining what we're doing and why we're doing it because that carryover is so important and the buy-in from, from the families um, to really trust that what we're doing is gonna be in the child's best interest. Um, and of course we do a lot of similar things with adults. We order equipment, orthotics, um, but we also play a pretty big role in supporting just global development. This is one area that I love that we're not only looking at gross motor skills. That's my specialty. But I know for this kiddo that by gaining sitting balance and trunk stability, now they're going to be able to speak louder, right? They're going to have better um, ability to have fine motor skills, right? What we're working on in PT can ultimately cross over into so many other areas. Um, and that's a really big piece of us fitting in the puzzle of a child's overall sort of development. Um, and again, good or bad, but for me, I love that we get to collaborate with a team. Again, for every kid, there's multiple adults, right? That have some investment in their life, some goals, some hopes for them. Um, but that could be their teachers, their other therapists, their you know aunties and uncles, everyone. Um, we have to be part of a team, right? Nothing we do is in isolation. Um, so I really did wanna focus in on sort of the, the pros and cons. Of course, I'm not going to say there's any cons, but it depends on who you are and what you're really looking for. But the, you know, the ups and downs and the things that make pediatrics so appealing and some of the things that you sort of have to prep for and, and roll with, right? I think every setting has those, those both sides to it. Um, but for me, the, the plus side to pediatrics is that it's so dynamic, right? Every patient is different. I may see a four-month-old one hour with torticollis, and then I may see a nine-month or a nine-year-old kiddo who has, you know, hemiparesis the, the next hour. And it is so variable. 
I don't get bored. <laughs> um, I weirdly, my own personality, I like routine. I like predictability. I like to be organized, but sometimes when you're working and you feel like you're doing the same thing over and over again, it, it can get a little tedious, but I promise you, you will never be bored in pediatrics because of how dynamic it is. Ages, diagnoses, personalities more than anything, right? Adults all have different personalities too, but most of them hopefully understand the etiquette and the rules of how to act in the world. So generally <laughs> they can adapt well to, to what we're teaching them. Um, and the other piece is that it is very, very family centered. All, you'll see as you get further into this you know, realm, all the research, all the literature, so much of what we talk about and study and, and preach really is being family centered. This, this child is part of a unit of other people blood family, chosen family, whatever it is, we want to see how our role can, can best support the family as a whole. And I think that's a really big piece and it allows us to kind of zoom out and really take perspective of what we're doing and, and why. Um, and it also just allows for a lot of room just to be creative and, and flexible and okay, I had a plan, but let's, let's reroute if we need to. And it, it really gives you options to sort of change up your approaches, which You'll see actually in my next slide, some of these pros can also be cons depending on what you're looking for. And I'll tell you, I'm very surprised that for myself, this creative sort of area, most of my second year students, I heard the most feedback as we went through our pediatrics course earlier in the spring. A lot of them were like, oh my gosh, you have to be so creative. Or like, how did you come up with that idea? Or, wow. I am not creative by nature. That is just not who I am. I've never been <laughs> super, you know, fun and free flowing. But even I could can jump into this, right? And I, I steal ideas from other people. I use the internet. I use Pinterest, right? I work with OTs that are, I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. I'm totally going to do that. So it's great if you are creative and you want that outlet, but it's also won't hold you back otherwise. Because if I can do it, anybody can. I do not have an imagination. I try and I'll go along with it. And half the time I'm imagining wrong. But I think as long as you have the effort and, and the spirit, then, then you've got enough of what it takes. Um, I also love that it is a team approach. You collaborate a lot with other people. I think most of us involved in PT are doing so because I would hope we're sort of people, people, maybe not large groups. You know, the, the benefit of PT is you do get to work one-on-one. -on -one. You do get to work directly with somebody and kind of create this, this coaching support mutual relationship. But for me, pediatrics really offers such a big scope of everyone involved in a child's care and really allows me to learn from the OTs and the speech pathologists and everybody else that, that may be involved um, with the team. Plus you get to see milestones achieved. That's super fun, right? Like watching someone take their first steps. It doesn't happen every day with every kid. And some of my kids don't take independent steps and that's okay, but we get to see those victories, like seeing how excited parents get or families get. I have a video, but I, I didn't have permission specifically for this context and since we were recording, but one of my telehealth kids, I was so lucky it was on telehealth because mom, I, I told her, let's start recording because I think he's close to crawling. And you see his sister, his dad, everyone's in the background like, oh my gosh, he's doing it. And to be part of that is really, really, really special. Um, and of course it can happen. You know, we see people achieve great things no matter where we are as PTs. That's what we're here for. But there's just a little something selfish doing it with pediatrics because you get a lot more fun milestones and growth and, and things in that in that regard, um, which makes it fulfilling, obviously meaningful, right? We, we could impact a whole family um, beyond even just one person. Plus it's fun. Oh my gosh. That, I mean, I said, I don't get bored. It's fun. I get to kind of be goofy and, and just have fun and play all day. And yes, it's play with my PT goggles on and from the outside, it might look silly, but I'm actually, the wheels are turning. <laughs> it, it is work, but it goes by much faster because of that, that fun element. Uh, and like I said, the, the challenges could be some, just the other side of some of those. So every patient is different. That could be a good thing or a bad thing. You know, I find sometimes too for students early on, it's sort of like, wait, I just figured out my rhythm with this one thing and this one scenario. And now we got to jump to something totally different. So it is a lot to take in. You do have to be able to shift gears, even just for me. Um, it may not seem like it. Those of you who don't know me, I, I, I'm sure you can already tell. I talk a lot. I'm kind of loud. I have a lot of energy, but I have to know with the right kids, some kids, I have to be much slower, much more mellow and adjust. 
some kids, I really have to kind of ramp up my energy to get them going with me. And, and it's not always easy having to sort of adapt yourself to meet all these different situations. Um, so that can be a challenge that you're, you're never really in one groove. It's not like, great, I figured this out and now I can coast, right? Um, of course, you might need to manage some behavior, right? Not everybody's thrilled to separate from mom or to meet a new person or to push themselves, right? That's still what we're doing as PTs. We're, we're challenging our patients to do things that are hard. Um, and sometimes that does take a little extra finesse, right? An understanding of how to approach a child and how to manage um, some potential behavior. Some of it is very typical and expected. Anyone who's been around a two-year-old knows that there is no logic. There is no sense. Like the world is just upside down and you've got to jump into it. Um, but there are some times where maybe you do need to have a little bit more structure, be a little bit more organized in order to keep your session going. Um, and of course, we're going to come across communication challenges that, that can of course happen with adults and with the neurological population, especially, but up I would say over half of my kiddos, most of the children I've worked with have been either nonverbal or very limited. So it's not like I can just say, all right, I'm going to explain our plan for today. And here's what we're going to do. And does that work for you? So we do have to find ways to adapt and adjust um, to those, those differences and those challenges. Um, and then, of course, as I said, it's really fun because you can be creative and flexible. But it's challenging because you really do have to be creative and you have to be flexible. <laughs> and those are not innate qualities of mine, but I've grown to appreciate them and, and hone in on them. The other side, and this is the reason that I picked this picture, PowerPoint has been doing a much better job of getting fun pictures in their stock photos, I have to say. But I was like, yes, yeah, sometimes it gets it can get messy. It can get fun. You know, things are not organized. <laughs> They're not pretty, but if you don't mind just getting in there and, and playing with shaving cream or whatever it is that happens to work that day, um, then, then you'll be okay. Um, the flip side to being so family centered, you know, we really are, as the, the woman in the first video said, you get to be there with your patients and it's really fun. You get to see them through a course of their life and growing up, but in the same flip side of the coin, right? Some of these families are dealing with really, really, really difficult challenges, right? Caring for a child, with a lot of needs, you know, and, and how that might impact. They may have multiple children with special needs of, of some kind. And so it is something that we have to be prepared for, right? We are in that situation. We are here helping and we may have to work around some families that are stressed. And sometimes that comes out on you and sometimes not having control, you know, is, is just a tough thing for families to manage. Um, it's not quite as often and depending on where you work in specialties, but sometimes we do work with children with progressive diagnoses. There's children sometimes who do not have a great outlook. And it's one of those things where I love working with kids and I love all the growth. And sometimes it, it is that love that makes it that much harder to see someone really struggling medically um, in, in that sense. So it's just something we have to work. It's kind of that you know, the same idea people are like, I love animals and therefore I could not be a vet because I can't ever give a dog a shot or whatever. You know, it's sort of, oh, this is so fun for me that I could never be the person to, to be involved if someone's unhappy. Um, but that does happen. And, you know, one other flip side too, is we, we do create such a good relationship with families. We create such a strong support system that sometimes it can actually be very challenging to discharge um, kiddos, especially in the outpatient setting. I have a lot of families that are just, I'm not ready to let go, or I'm not, you know, they don't have quite as much faith in themselves or they think, but my child isn't doing everything perfectly. So I need you forever. And sometimes it can be a little hard to sort of separate that a little bit because we want to help everybody with everything, right? Um, I just wanted to pause there and see if, if anybody had questions or thoughts on some of the things I've, I've talked about. Um, I am going to go into, whoops, um, some of the populations that we treat and some of the settings, but I know I've been rambling for a few minutes, so please feel free um, to throw anything in the chat or unmute yourself if, if any of that sparked a question or a thought. <laughs> I'll keep going, but I, I have a quick question just yeah. with um, my experience is mainly in aquatic therapy. Some yeah. kids we had, which was super fun because the pool is a way more interesting oh, yeah. and exciting environment. And they can't but, run away from you in the pool. Yeah. <laughs> I have, um, how do you deal with parents who maybe are a little bit too overbearing or have a hard time um, carrying over what you've taught in the session to home? I think 
you know, and it's I'll kind of split it into two questions. There's overbearing and then there's hard time carrying over. I think the most powerful piece is from the beginning, establishing sort of what you're doing, why you're doing it, explaining things. Cause I have talked to so many parents where I'll ask, okay, what are they working on? You know, with this other therapy or, oh, what about with school? They'll say, oh, I don't know. They're kind of, they like play games. And to me, it just means that they don't really understand the therapeutic piece of what's going on. And so I think it's really helpful from the beginning to be almost overly, you know, explaining things and really getting them to follow your logic because then they buy in and they really know what's going on. Um, but they also trust your judgment that when they really understand that the wheels are turning, oh, you actually are like a professional at the, you know, I think there's many people that think I'm, you know, a glorified preschool teacher, or, you know, you're like the PE lady or whatever. And obviously they're experts in their fields of education, but I think sometimes they don't quite recognize the level that, you know, how we're looking at things in a medical sense. Um, so I find that that really helps me reach out to the parents and get a better relationship when they really understand what I'm doing. The overbearing ones, sometimes it is just having a tough conversation and saying, you know what, I'd really like to see for today how, you know, Joey does if you're on that side of the gym or maybe if you step out for 10 minutes, I wonder if he might be a little bit more on board. Cause I have a lot of parents that feel like they need to be the one saying, okay, do this. Okay. Be good listener. You know, okay. You know, follow along, but then you just have too many voices. Um, so sometimes I explain it in that context. I think it might be a little overwhelming or maybe they're worried about impressing you or whatever. Um, but sometimes they do have to slow roll. I have to give a couple of sessions of letting them maybe not give us the best session, but if they see like, Hey, I can, I can handle it. Like, you know, you're often, I see parents who think, Oh my gosh, my kid is just too much for somebody else to deal with. Right. And I've been there, I'm, my own child. I'm like, Oh, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> he's, he's got a lot of energy or whatever. If he doesn't listen for you, Oh my gosh, I'm going to feel terrible. So I, I fully understand the parent side, but I think if they see after a few sessions that, you know, I'm, I could hold my own, I'm all right. You know, I will he's not gonna run the show and nothing positive will happen. So I think that really helps. And then from the carryover at home, that is a challenge, an ongoing challenge often. Again, education helps, but I have a lot of parents who maybe can't stay during the sessions. They got three other kids in the waiting room and they can't sit and have their undivided attention here. Um, and hopefully you're in a place that allows you a little bit of time and flexibility to where I often will do like pictures and, or the kids really like calendars and I'll have them put a sticker every time they come bring it back next week, something like that, that kind of gets the kid involved when possible. Um, but otherwise it's a lot of checking in. And, and I really think the carryover piece, which this goes for adults, for anybody, I think part of making sure you get good carryover is giving an appropriate home program. Often I'm like, I have 10 ideas of all these things that would be so great. But if I recognize that that's not going to fit for that family, you know, I may say, Hey, I want you to spend 20 minutes a day doing X, Y, Z. If it doesn't fit, if they don't have the time or the space in their schedule, they're not going to do it. And in some ways that's on me. Right. So I do try to do a lot of incorporate. Hey, when you get in the car into the car seat, have them step up and climb and try this, or when you're getting out of the bath or base it around routines. Um, there's a whole nother level of research and studies for routines based interventions, but, but part of it is making it an accessible home program for the family. Um, and that involves getting to know them and asking the right questions sometimes. I'm sure I over answered, but was there anything that I missed? <laughs> no, that was perfect. Thank you. Very creative. I think that's what scares me about pediatrics is that it's a lot of problem solving, but it is. all of your answers <laughs> made a lot of sense. So thank yeah. you. Oh, great. Um, and again, if anyone else has thoughts or questions, feel free to jump in anytime. Um, I did want to quickly talk about the types of populations that we're seeing um, and some of the, like, the types of diagnoses that may come up. Again, I mentioned often it's children with developmental disabilities or developmental delays. Um, it's a little more rare. You don't see a kid who broke their arm and then comes to PT afterwards. Like they're just they boing back, they're springy mobile children. And so, you know, a kind of more typical adult scenario doesn't always happen with kids. I have seen older, you know, I've seen high school athletes with chronic ankle sprains. I've seen, you know, whiplash after a car accident um, and chronic headaches. I, I do see some things that are a little bit more pure ortho, but 
a large part of our population is children with some type of developmental delays. Um, and developmental delay itself, that's the you know ICD-10 code, that's sort of our low back pain, right? That's our just like something's not right. And then you figure out why or what, you know, more details. But developmental delay is a diagnosis. Um, and often those are kids who may be getting more medical workup. They don't quite know exactly what's going on. Um, but for some reason, they're not achieving milestones at the rate or the way that um, is expected. Um, but also, like was mentioned in the video, we may see children born prematurely because we know that that impacts their physical growth and development. Um, a whole onset, there's many, many genetic conditions, deletions, chromosomal abnormalities. I put Down syndrome just because that's a very, you know, well known. That's, that's probably the population that I am the most sort of in with. I've seen the most children with um, Down syndrome. I'm very involved kind of with that population, but they're unfortunately is a whole lot of small, teeny tiny genetic things that can really alter someone's entire body system. Um, and of course we see kids with um, cerebral palsy. That's probably where the most research is right now actually in pediatrics is around cerebral palsy. And it's a very common diagnosis actually. Um, torticollis, as I mentioned, is, a, is often seen in little ones and infants where it impacts the mobility and the positioning of their neck. Um, we see children with autism, developmental coordination disorder, spina bifida, which is essentially a congenital spinal cord injury. Um, and even I, I actually see a lot of children with epilepsy, whether that's in combination with other diagnoses or not, but um, sometimes more of a general neurological um, concern. But of course, that's no way all encompassing, right? We see kids with kind of focus on all different systems. Cystic fibrosis um, is a cardiopulmonary or is a pulmonary um, diagnosis, even children with asthma. But again, as I mentioned before, in the hospital, you might see limb amputations. There's pediatric burn um, care that goes on, all sorts of things. But these are some of the, the kind of bigger diagnoses that I'm sure you'll be talking about um, in more depth in school. And of course, the body systems that we treat. I, I think the pediatric sort of practice model fits the most with the neuromuscular, primarily because we do focus very much on function and movement analysis. And it's a little bit less focused on each impairment and more on the big picture of how does that impact your, um, your movements and, and your independence. Um, but of course, we really have to understand a lot of the orthopedic system because even for example, a child with cerebral palsy, right? That's a neuromuscular diagnosis. We have to know what spasticity is. We have to know how to do postural control training, manage, you know, tone, deal with equipment. But there's also a lot of secondary orthopedic complications that come along with it. So we really now are also treating their ortho system. And often posture and muscle tone can impact your breathing, right? And your respiratory system. So, um, I really think it ultimately comes down to multi-system, but just recognizing that it's it's any and everything in a small person, right? <laughs> or a big person. I've treated some kids bigger than me before. <laughs> um, okay, so now discussing settings. I did wanna just give a little bit of a glimpse into some of these different settings in case any of them are, have already sparked your interest or if you know you're going into a, a clinical in some of these areas, just to kind of get an idea of how they all differ. And they're primarily areas unique to EI, I mean, um, sorry, unique to pediatrics. Again, I think acute care is still acute care um, and, and some of these other settings are very similar to what you think um, for adults. Um, but school-based therapy is one very unique setting for pediatrics and essentially because of IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, physical therapy is actually considered a related service that helps children um, with disabilities benefit from special education. So the idea is all children deserve a free and accessible public education, right? Um, and we don't want the fact that they may have some type of disability to limit their access to school. So it's one of those things if, you know, obviously with ADA, everything's supposed to be physically accessible, but the idea is if their physical skills or independence is limiting them from actually participating at school or taking advantage of the curriculum. If they can't sit up on their own, well then it's on the school to provide the supports they need to help them sit and now attend in class. Um, one of the big pieces is that it is a natural environment, right? It's a place that kids are naturally. I'm not taking them to my clinic and using all this special equipment, right? This is where kids 
are most days, uh, you know, they spend a lot of time at school. So we can make a really big impact on their function. Um, and the unique piece about this is that their plan of care is essentially, it's part of an IEP, which stands for Individualized Education Plan. Um, but that again is a whole team of people, teachers, any specialized you know, therapists or, or specialists that are involved in supporting the child, all get together and say, what are we hoping to accomplish? What are this, this child's strengths? What are their weaknesses? And how can we support them in getting the education they deserve? So for PT, that may look like, hey, the library is on the second floor and they can't get up the stairs by themselves. So we're gonna make a goal to get, let them carry a book up the stairs or walk with their backpack without falling over. Or, you know, it, it ends up being a lot more functional goals. We won't write a goal for they're gonna stand by themselves for 10 seconds. It might be they're gonna stand by themselves for 10 seconds so that they can wait in line going to recess. Like we always tie it into what part of their school day is this gonna help them with? Um, and I think some of the pros of working in a school, um, other than one, they actually pay pretty well and it counts as public service um, for those who might be eligible for loan forgiveness. Stay out of the news, it's a big mess. Hopefully by the time you all graduate and can apply for this 10 year loan forgiveness, it'll be cleaned up. <laughs> it's supposed to be coming back, but, but yes, you're working for a publicly funded, um, if it's not a private school, if it's a public school, which are the ones that have to offer PT. Um, then yeah, you, you work essentially around a school schedule um, and, and you, you do get paid pretty well, um, but also you get to see the kids where they are most of their day, right? It can make a big impact. Um, you can incorporate peers, you can incorporate, you know, you've got recess to work with, right? Um, often a playground, play structure, things like that. Um, but some of the cons for working in a school, especially I kind of caution new grads going solo into a school, um, is that you often are sort of the one PT that works in a school. Like, okay, I'm here to see all the kids in this site. So you may not get to overlap and interact a lot with other PTs. So especially if you're newer, you are a little bit more on your own and may not have quite as much. Some programs, you know, LAUSD is huge and therefore they have a lot of therapists and a lot more support. Um, so some schools may offer more things in terms of mentorship, but but often you are sort of the PT there that day. Um, and you may be doing a lot of driving because unless it's a school specifically for children with disabilities, um, you may only have two or three kids to see at one school site and then you'll drive to the next school, you know, usually in the same area, but, but you, there may be a lot of driving. And then the last downside um, for me, which is the downside is that it is a lot of meetings because the therapy is um, required by law Often if families feel that they are not getting the services they deserve or if something else is going on, an IEP is a legal document. And so often there can be a lot of kind of litigious things, a lot of meetings, a lot of documenting, very things get scrutinized. And so um, I find for school you do, because you're part of the team and you're in a meeting for every single kid, um, sometimes you do miss on actual intervention time because you're in these meetings. But but you are an advocate for, for those students. Um, so it is important that they have PT there for that reason. And if anyone has questions about school, please stop me. I'm trying to keep it shorter so that, you know, we can get to more questions later, but, um, but that's school-based. Another part of IDEA actually um, gives federal funding to support children that are identified as at risk for delays or already having delays. So that's children birth to three years old. Once they're three, they're considered eligible for school services. Now they're school aged, but under three years old, there's actually federal funding um, to help support them. And that's because we know so much brain development, um, global development happens from birth to three years old that we recognize let's invest our resources early, support these children early and down the line, it may prevent them from having more extensive medical um, educational needs. Um, and so, they have something similar. It's called an individualized family service plan. It's sort of the precursor to an IEP, an education plan. But again, it's very focused on development, very um, family centered. And that's when you, you see a lot of little kids. So often those can be um, done with home visits. It's preferred actually to see the child in a natural environment. So it may just be, hey, I'm going to show up at your house and teach you how to cruise along the couch. Let's, you know, show you how to how to support your child. Um, and I've spent 
I guess I'd say a biggest bulk of my time in early intervention. Um, and I've really, really appreciated it. Again, it's a little greedy because we get the little ones and the babies and they're the cutest and we get to see the most, you know, room for growth um, all the way up through three years old. But again, that's, that's federally funded. All children have uh, the ability to access these services without paying for them potentially if, if they can't afford it. And then the NICU, this is one area I have not been in personally um, because it's highly, highly specialized and it takes actually, um, it's one of the few settings that requires advanced training um, and specifics. Obviously these are very medically fragile babies. Um, my mom is a retired NICU nurse. So I get a little bit of a, I try and give myself some, you know, street cred from her <laughs> and hearing her stories and knowing, you know, what goes on. But um, this is where you're caring for medically fragile um, infants. But again, the collaboration you have with the families, the impact you can have at such an early stage, and, and you really do have an ability to be a very positive impact in a very challenging space sometimes. Oh, cool. Maya's mom too. Hey, my mom was at Kaiser in um, Hayward, actually, and San Leandro. Anyway, they changed a bunch of things. They're building a new one there, but but yeah, represent for the NICU nurses. This is, a, this is a tough place too, right? And this is where I talk about, it is hard because you got to deal with hard stuff sometimes, including very, very complex, you know, life-threatening um, things. And then lastly, one specialized um, thing, this is specific to California. And since we're the California Student Special Interest Group, I don't feel like I'm going off track by talking about it, but California Children's Services is a state funded program um, that will actually pay for medical care and therapy services for children that, that qualify. Um, and what they have is a medical therapy program that gives OT and PT services for patients that are eligible. Um, if people are more, if you're interested in this more, we can talk about it you know, at another time. But in general, these are the kids who have a diagnosis of cerebral palsy. Um, if you have a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, you automatically qualify, but there's other neuromuscular conditions, um, chronic conditions, musculoskeletal connective tissue um, issues, and then um, some other, it, something like Down syndrome doesn't count, but often they're the sort of more involved neurological type patients, um, but this is its own sort of system. They actually have the ability because it's California Children's Services, again, it's a team. They work with neurologists on the team. They have orthotists. It's, it's very structured and very research backed um, to support uh, children with these different diagnoses. So this may be, some of you may have clinicals set up with CCS, one of their MTUs. They're often actually in schools. Um, but I, I do find that they see the children that are a little bit more involved and because it's state funded, it is hard to qualify. It's not like, yeah, they'll just, you know, give money to everybody for all the therapy they want. Um, often I'll, I'll see children either in my outpatients um, clinic practice, I've seen children who have been discharged from CCS, but they still have some kind of residual delays that the family wants to, to um, go through their private insurance for. Um, but it is another, um, setting, I'm going to call it, because it deals with very specific patient populations. And they do a lot more sort of ordering equipment and, and from that end. Okay. Um, my last little bit before I can get into any other open questions and things, I did want to share this slide with student resources, um, mostly because there's so many questions and sort of a, a lot of options out there that I just wanted to point you sort of in the right direction. The, the first slide is just to get to the APDA section on pediatrics. Hopefully, if you are an APTA member, you can add the little bit to be a pediatric section member for the special interest groups um, because the benefits there are, are really, really strong. I really appreciate all the work that they've been doing. And they actually have a student new professional special interest group. That's what SNP stands for. Um, and that's where you can actually sign up to get a mentor, a specific pediatric therapist mentor, which is a program that I, I'm part of. Actually, our rotation ends next month. Um, I'm mentoring a new grad um, who is in a more rural area and doesn't have a lot of other PTs around to sort of bounce ideas off of. Um, but I believe students are, are open for that as well. And I think their next pairing, actually, you can sign up either late May or early June. Um, so I would look for those who are really interested or maybe going to be on a clinical in the next few months or in the next year. It might be nice to have a pediatric mentor. You meet once a month. It's very 
you know, low stakes. It's not super time consuming, but it is organized and actually really helpful. They even organize mentorship circles and groups where you can talk with people in different settings. Um, and it just helps expand a little bit of your, your networking, right? Um, which never hurts anything. And then what I really like, and the students who take my elective are going to see a lot of these, but um, the pediatric section actually has created a lot of really, really helpful fact sheets. So meant for families, meant for students, but just sort of concise information, sort of pockets on, on key topics where you can go and look up. They have, you know, orthotics fact sheets, the basics about orthotics. They have what is idea, what is school-based therapy. Um, and I find it's a really good kind of starting place sometimes when you're curious about a topic to be able to look more into it in a, in a clear kind of concise way instead of going through Dr. Brown's old PowerPoint that's 60 slides long, right? <laughs> um, and then I did want to mention, I, I think it's still early for, for a lot of you who may be considering it, but um, if you are considering um, a pediatric clinical specialist, just knowing that, that that is a specialty designation you can get, um, you can go through two routes similar to all the other specialties. You can do a residency program, which is a one-year sort of guided program in, in preparation for um, taking the exam to, to get a clinical specialist designation. Or the route that I went, you can do once you have 2000 hours of patient care with this population. So it's not something you have to do, you know, day one when you graduate, but if you do work with this population long enough that you have 2000 hours um, of experience then you are eligible to, to test for that. Um, again, there's actually way more residency options now than there was when I first started looking. I think there was three in the whole country. California only has one and it's at CHLA. Um, but I do think that that's, Something just to keep in the back of your mind is cool. If this is something I really want to pursue, um, then that that is an option down the road. But you don't have to be a specialist in order to work in a pediatric facility. In fact, most not everybody is. It's it's not quite as common. Um, so I just want to throw that out there in case people have more questions. And then my last little bit is just my my clinical tips. So I was thinking about those who are about to go on a. a clinical rotation, maybe like Diana, um, or have something lined up, just things to consider when you're working with kids that do, do show up. These are the lessons that I feel like I give the most to my students. I was a CI for seven years or so, um, working with long-term end of the rotation students. Um, so I think the number one tip I can give is always have a plan B. And I think that's true almost in any setting, but with with the kiddos, I find my students will come up with a really smart, very logical treatment plan, and they, they have a plan in their mind, and it's great. We're going to rescue Princess Elsa from the tower by getting up these stairs, and that kid walks in today, and they don't like Princess Elsa anymore, and it's like, oh my gosh, what do I do? You know, so just that idea of have a plan B. What is the ultimate goal of what I'm trying to accomplish, and what are two or three ways that I can get there? Because without a doubt, at some point, your plans will be derailed. So just recognizing, oh, if this is too hard, do I have a way to make it easier? If this doesn't appeal to them, you know, how can I, you know, create a new game to accomplish the same thing? Um, and then I find actually with some of my kiddos using either a, a written schedule, if they're old enough and can understand that, or even a visual schedule. We had um, little pictures, thanks to our lovely speech therapists who are really great with this stuff, but um, you know, I may have a picture of a slide and a swing and a soccer ball. And I, the, with the kiddo, we can make a plan. Say, great, first we're going to play soccer, then we'll do the slide, and then we'll, you know, go to the swing. And that way you have something to reference as they're sort of going rogue or maybe not quite wanting to stick with the plan. You can always say, oh, great, what's next? And sometimes just having that visual schedule to reference can be really, really helpful. Um, songs. I'm not a, a singer. I do not have the, the voice of an angel, but thankfully most kids, most, I've been shushed before, most kids don't mind. Um, but songs can actually be a really, really powerful tool um, to the point where we always have a wireless speaker in most of our gyms and the clinics I've worked at. Um, but again, sometimes it's just a transition. It's just a familiar song. Hey, this is our cue that now, it's just like the cleanup song, right? That works with every kid most of the time, you know, but, oh, if I sing the cleanup song, then now, cool, we're doing something fun instead of pick up your toys. So I, I often encourage people to get past any insecurities they have about singing because <laughs> you probably will need it at some point. 
Um, and then the last little tip I have for working with kiddos, if you are on a clinical, um, is making sure you're not giving options that you're not ready for. I think it's just human nature. I even find myself still doing it sometimes is, is asking, hey, do you want to go play soccer? I'm going to sell it. I think this is a great idea. This is my plan. Great. Do you want to play soccer? I'm not going to ask, do you want to, if the answer no is not really something that I can accommodate <laughs> or if that's really not a plan, right? So often the yes or no questions will be met with no, regardless of how fun of an activity you've offered, especially for toddlers, no is really, really easy uh, when given the choice. So often I'll say, okay, instead, you know, maybe we give an option so that they still have some control. I'm not saying boss a child around. I'm not saying force anybody to do anything that they really don't want to do. It's more instead like, oh, great. I want to do kicking. So I'll ask, oh, should we kick the red ball or the blue ball? What do you think is, you know, which one would you like? The kicking isn't an option because that's our therapeutic activity, but you do have some control and some type of an option. I think one of my mentors early on basically said, you're not going into Toys R Us, which, oh my gosh, is dating me because those are gone now, I think too, but you're not going into the toy store and saying, take whatever you want. As much as we like to be child led, she's like, I'm telling them you can have anything you want on aisle three. Like we're going to go here and then you can have fun. So just that idea of making sure you frame your your questions, your communication in a way that doesn't leave it open for them to just say, well, no, because <laughs> it will happen. Um, but just ideas about communicating and so, or great, now it's time to go here. Instead of, do you want to go here? We just say, oh, awesome. Up next, here's what we're doing. Um, again, I don't condone bossing anybody around, forcing anybody into anything. It's more knowing how to finesse the scenario to get somebody to go along with your, your wacky plan. <laughs> Um, so hopefully those can help a few people. There's, there's definitely more as you get into specifics, but I think on a, on a tip of the iceberg level, these are good things to keep in mind before you head into a clinical. And then I've left space just for questions. And I think if everyone's okay with it, I'll stop sharing my screen. All I have here is my references and my, my email at the end, but I'm curious if anyone has questions or thoughts or if that sparked any anything. I talked longer than I wanted to. I'm sorry. I get excited, but <laughs> I'm open if anyone has questions. Does dealing with difficult behaviors during, you know, a treatment session ever um, get to the point where you actually can't get anything done? And how do you deal with that? Yes. <laughs> and there are, it, it, it you know, I've, I've had parents to tell us, oh my gosh, you're so patient. And how do you stay so patient? And I will say it is different when you are not the parent, because my expectation of that child may be different, right? As a parent, you're like, oh my gosh, if they do anything wrong, it's a reflection of me. You know, they're going to think that I have no rules at home or whatever. But for me, I really encourage, I, I've talked to my students about this a lot too, is just sort of meet the child where they are, first of all. So sometimes avoiding that battle is me creating the right expectations for the session and kind of knowing that child enough to say, you know, maybe this wasn't the, the best plan. I don't think they're, you know, as capable of this as I would like, but, um, you know, other than adjusting my expectations and sometimes trying to say, Hey, I would love it. If in our 50 minute session, we got these five things done, but maybe I need to scale back and say, all right, we're going to get two things done. So often it is me, me compromising for sake of long-term rapport and continuity you know it's not like with adults where it's like great we got eight sessions let's get in there let's get this this is like if we push too hard and we battle and we clash too much you're just never going to want to come to therapy and then you're not getting anything um so there are times that that it can and i use whatever resources if the parent being involved helps i mean there are sometimes where kiddos are so they don't want to leave mom's lap or they don't even want to look at me, then I'm like, great, I will just chat from next to you and talk to mom and just guide her the whole way through. So sometimes you do have to have to pivot. Um, and I will say I've worked with kids who, the ones who do tend to have a little bit more of the more challenging behaviors, whether it's elopement, um, that's a lot of setting up the environment, the kids who run, because that's a safety issue. Um, Often it's setting up the environment, but I do have kiddos who come with um, behavior therapists with them and often we'll work as a team, we'll strategize. I bring in the family and say, you know, what do you do? But 
I have my little bag of tricks of, you know, whether it's this communication technique, structuring things, but there are days where it's like, today was a rough day, but we can, we can get back at it next time. Or I say, you know what, maybe you just need five minutes on that swing to chill out for a little bit. Maybe you are laying face down and I'm not, I can't pretend we're working on postural control, but, but we do discuss regulation. And like, if you're getting way too overexcited or something's going on, take that time. And for me, it's just allowing myself to be okay with knowing like this break is ultimately going to pay off later. Right. It's, it's the whole self-care idea too, right? Like you can't pour from empty cup. This poor kid is losing it. I can't keep pushing them. Um, which is hard to do sometimes, but I, I think more often than not my expectations some days I've had kiddos where I'm like, great. We walked up the stairs twice in 45 minutes. Like it's the best day ever. <laughs> and you just work on peace and building slowly, you know, from there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, I'm, I'm more than happy if, if people want to throw things in the chat or anything like that, or even asking about specialty settings. I'm so glad that Maya, you got to do aquatic stuff. I just set up some observations for my students for the summer. Cause I'm like, I, you, you just have to see it. You just got to be there <laughs> to get it. Hippotherapy. I didn't even get to mention that. There's a lot of research there. I say, just go try and observe everything you can take it all in and, and see what kind of fits the best. You know, I worked for a clinic um, in Torrance and they do a, an adaptive summer camp every year. So as a PT, I got to spend two weeks playing Gundam style and dancing around a room and doing motor station. I was like, I'm getting paid for this. You know, I was like, this is great. You know, um, so there's a lot of options, a lot of cool stuff out there that I think will hopefully interest everyone. Oh, yeah, Eliza's here. Yeah, you'll get to do some field trips with me this summer. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Stacey. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. And um, I'm a second year and uh, I already got my placement for third year. Ooh. And I'm luckily going to be at an outpatient peds clinic and I'm really excited for. Um, my one question is like, I also have somewhat of an interest in the inpatient side of peds mm -hmm. and um, with the whole process of everyone getting their placements, I don't think it's going to get be possible for me to get one, yeah. um, but before I graduate. So navigating when I graduate, um, going into or trying the field or trying to get into like just try it yeah. without that experience. Um, I do have a bit of like adult inpatient experience. Okay. Um, I'm just worried like how that would translate from like the outpatient peds experience to like an inpatient. And, you know, I think, and that is a good question because it is pretty, it's similar to folks who are like, well, I did a school-based rotation, but now I'm kind of looking to come here. The settings are different, but I absolutely think that having any type of a peds rotation, having that outpatient rotation will give you a lot of the skills that you can kind of leverage. I, I don't think employers would say, well, you don't have experience in patients, so maybe not. I think you can absolutely use what you learn from the outpatient and then combo that with the adult acute that you get. I think most programs you require an acute care setting it's in some level. So I think just being able to, to leverage both of those and fuse them together, um, I would not let that hold you back. And actually, I think an inpatient setting or like an acute set, a hospital based, um, often there's children's hospitals, you know, where, where some of those kids go for surgery. I think those are really great places, especially for a new grad, because they have so much support for things like continuing ed. They usually have bigger departments. Um, some of the outpatient clinics can be smaller and you might be two PTs or three, you know, I think my clinic had four or five at the most at any given time. And so, um, I think it would be understood as a new grad. And I think, from working in the clinics that I've been at, often our expectation for a new grad is not the same as for someone who's been there for a while. So I think when you're looking for, for jobs, especially just asking in the interview process or as you're applying, 
Do you have room for mentorship? Like you don't have to downplay the fact that you're a new grad. You know, I think it's, it's something to say, Hey, I'm here because I'm open and interested to learn. And, and that's what they really look for, but finding places that offer structured mentorship and that have some of that continuing ed. But I think if anything, it'll, it will probably be easier than you think to, to jump into, you know, it's, it's still the same principles of how do I motivate? How do I get this done? But often the, you know, the documenting and some of that will be a little different. Um, but yeah, don't, don't let it discourage you if the placement doesn't exactly match up. Cause I actually had the opposite. We hired someone that did inpatient and was terrified to come outpatient, but she really wanted to. We're like, we got you. Like, you know, you know how to be a professional, how to talk to parents, how to engage kids. Like that's the basics that you need. And you really can translate that to different places. So I'm excited for your rotation though. It'll be fun. <laughs> Um, can you tell me what it's like, uh, one of your favorite experiences working with uh, a child, like uh, one of your best experiences? Oh my gosh, that's hard. I think actually part of what I touched on before, and maybe because I can relive it, but my kiddo who the, his crawling for the first time, because I was with him, he had a genetic condition and had like open heart surgery really young, but I was working with him from six months old, probably in home, um, which is where you really do. And in his home was mom, dad, two older siblings, grandma, and uncle was like part-time. He ended up moving out. The whole crew was there with me, you know? And so I got to know everybody really well, but he was a kiddo that, I mean, from head control to standing, I, I saw him the whole way. So catching on video, his first real like crawling and see like his sister's playing video games in the background. She's literally looking at the TV and she goes, <gasps> and looks at her mom, like at her brother. And so that for me was really fun because Everybody just happened to be there. Um, but I think otherwise, I'll totally go cheater and say summer camp because that was my dream, right? I wanted to be a camp counselor. <laughs> and finally, I got adaptive summer camp and I led the motor <laughs> therapy stations. Um, but yeah, I, I think those two probably stand out to me as, as some of the best. But I've seen a couple other first steps and really exciting you know, moments that, that, are, that stick with you. <laughs> it's a good question, thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Brown, uh, comment for me and then a question um, I was sent privately in the chat. Comment for me. Oh, I just missed it. Oh, oh, it came to me privately. Oh, okay, got it. But I did want to say thank you for getting me very excited about early intervention. Um, wow. I've always wanted to do peds. I, that was the one thing that I've told everyone at my school. Like, I just want to try it. I just want to try it. Yeah. I just want to try it. And I was nervous to be working with babies because I'm the baby of my family. So I do not have mm -hmm. that experience, but now you saying like all these motor milestones, it's the greedy part. I'm very excited. <laughs> and honestly, I think Pete's rotations are probably where you get the most grace. I think, you know, sometimes I talk to students, they're with me like 16 weeks when I had my, I usually, I took several students from Chapman. That was kind of where we had, and, and USC. Sorry, West Coast, I never had any of us, but <laughs> um, usually on a longer term rotation. And some of them, you know, one of them even, I think it was like week two, she's like, am I behind? You know, some of my classmates are going so, you know, they're in an outpatient, they're do they've done an eval already, or they, they're they seeing patients by themselves in a sniff or whatever it is. And I think just given the nature of how much we build rapport and how dynamic and how different it is, all pediatric CIs, start, you know, they're, they're just way more involved. Right. In fact, I had to tell my students eventually, I'm like, kick me out. You know, I will sit on my hands and I will sit in the corner. Cause I, you know, you get attached. These are your, your kids. Right. Um, but I do think for those who are intimidated potentially by a pediatric rotation or anything, the CIs there are so much, it's like, let's start at square. I do like, great. You plan one activity and I'll let you go. It, it, it might be a little hard, you know, I might throw you in for a bit, but then I'll, I'll rescue, you know, I won't leave you solo <laughs> by yourself to go off and do things on your own. So I, I do think that there is just an understanding of how so many different things come into play. It's clinical reasoning and behavior management and creativity that, that we really do scaffold it and build it up. Um, and actually a lot of, especially the outpatient clinics I've been at, a lot of them Auto, they default to weekly feedback meetings, like things that for me were so valuable that I realized not everywhere else has the time or the ability to schedule that in. Um, and for those who've already been on clinical rotations, I'm sure 
you've seen the difference in CIs or how things might go faster or slower, but, but PEDS, we really do understand it's, it's a buildup and for new grads too. Um, but we're just so excited and want everyone to come join our side that we're like, no, no, we'll teach you everything. Just come on over. <laughs> so it, it's not too scary to, to break into it. <laughs> Beautiful. The question that was in the chat is um, for the school based therapists. Are they working year round or are they only during school? Um, <laughs> kind of. So often um, they do follow a regular school schedule. The main exception is ESY, which is extended school year. It's summer school. Often summer school, especially for um, elementary and middle schools, are for the children who do have special education mostly because the long break may really hinder their, their progress. They do have to justify and say, hey, do you think this child is gonna lose some of their skills or be negatively impacted by such a long break? Cause school is one of the constants for a lot of these kiddos. Um, so often the therapists are doing ESY because the kids that they support are in school. Um, but that's usually a month out of the year. There's at least a month off six weeks um, for most of them where there is no, and also school holidays, right? Like. If, if it's spring break, like that is my spring break. <laughs> so, you know, for me as a parent, I'm like, why do they have so many breaks? Like, don't make me watch my own kid. But, but you do get that end. And similar to like teachers, right? It's not that idea of like, oh, you're done by three every day. You're, you're documenting and writing reports, but you're not treating until five in the clinic, you know? So from that end, I think the flexibility is, is really nice um, to have that school schedule. Um, but again, there's, they're still reporting and documenting and you go home and make a home program and you're like, I got to find that YouTube video for them tomorrow. You know, you kind of go off on these little, you can't completely sever work and, <laughs> and home. Oh my gosh. Has anyone seen severance yet? By the way, I just thought it's on Apple. <gasps> okay. It's too much. You're studying. You're good for you. I'm just, I said sever work and home. And that's the whole premise of the, the show. I digress. <laughs> oh, good. Danny's seen it. Okay. <laughs> it's really good. Um, but yeah, school-based therapists have a little summer, but not three months off. I, I do know actually several therapists who you either take that time and say, hooray, I have a good break, or some folks actually will work per diem or do side, get, like they have a little freedom in the summer to do something kind of different or, or, you know, outside their norm just to make a little extra cash. Um, but pay-wise, it's one of the better paid pediatric <laughs> types of settings you could be in. These are good questions. And no, no pressure for anyone else to, <laughs> to keep going, but I'll talk forever so you can cut me off. <laughs> do we have any more questions for Dr. Brown because we do want to be mindful of her time. <laughs> the eye roll, I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, if there are no further questions, I just wanted to thank everyone on behalf of CASIG. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for coming in and speaking. You're very welcome. Thank you for letting us record this so we can share this with everyone. Yeah. Um, and I hope everyone has a lovely evening. This was yeah, awesome. yeah. Good luck. If any of you are in finals, I know it's kind of that time for us. So good luck with all your exams. There's always a test somewhere. So good luck with whatever the next one is. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Brown. You're welcome. Bye.